And welcome to Healing X Outreach Radio. I am your host, Augusta Nastasio, and I want to welcome you to today's program. I uh, just want to give you an update on the next couple of programs coming later on this month so that uh, you won't miss it. You can always check our archives and check our schedule of programs for the next four weeks always on uh, www.blogtalkradio.com backslash Healing X, that's the letter X, Outreach. And there we have a list of all of our programs from the past and the upcoming weeks of programs that we have uh, scheduled. Uh, The next couple weeks, we have next week at 11 o'clock, it's a special time, 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time program, we have Dr. Ron Rhodes. And if you're a former Jehovah's Witness, that is familiar with apologetics, then you know who Ron Rhodes is. He wrote a fantastic book called Reasoning from the Scriptures with the Jehovah's Witnesses. He's also written several books on other cults, from, uh, same line, Reasoning from the Scriptures with the uh, Mormon Church or the Mormons and uh, Islam. It goes on and on and on. And he just received a special honor. He received the Harvest House Gold Medallion Award and that means Harvest House has sold a million of his books. He's the author of over 40, over 60 books. So um, I think that's a significant achievement for Dr. Rhodes. And we're going to have him on next week at 11 o'clock. So if you have questions to ask Dr. Rhodes, he's going to share his testimony on how he uh, either was raised a Christian or became a Christian. I don't know. This will be my first time hearing his testimony and how he got involved in ministry He was associated with CRI for a while. That's the Christian Research Institute. So I think that's also something significant. And then um, we have on November 16th, and uh, once again it will be 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we have a debate. This will be a two-hour debate, and the title of the debate is Does the Bible Teach That Jesus is Almighty God? And we will have Dr. Phil Fernandez uh, taking the pro position on that question, and we will have author David Barron and Unitarian that will be taking the con position on that um, debate. So that is going to be a great debate. Both of these men are very well read, very scholarly men, and so on. If you want to get to listen to that debate, be there, be square, be there. It's 3 o'clock Eastern time. If you're in the Pacific, it's early. It's um, probably, I think, about noon. So, uh, And we will take questions and answers. We will have a Q&A segment on that debate. And then lastly, at uh, November 23rd, we will do a retelecast of Roland McKenzie, who uh, his, his website is gospeloutreach.net, and he is a former Seventh-day Adventist. He actually worked in the library, and we, he will be sharing his testimony in that retelecast. That will be a retelecast of his testimony and how he um, left a Sunday Adventist Church and became a Christian. So, without further ado, I want to introduce our current guest today, and his name is Eric Dement. He is a fourth generation, fourth generation that is, former reorganized Latter-day Saint. And so, he is also a Unix program uh, programmer. He has an MDiv degree from North Park Theological Seminary. He's associated with several ministries. EMNR, which is at EMNR.org, Evangelical Ministries to New Religions, the Institute for Christian Apologetics. You can go to Contender.org for that website and the Centers for Apologetics Research at www.thecenters.org. And he has a blog called unscriptedremarks.blogspot.com. So without further ado, I want to welcome Eric Clement to the program. Eric, you are on the air. Hi. I'm uh, really pleased to be here. Thank you for the invitation. (laughs) No, it's it's my pleasure to have you on. Uh, You will be the first uh, reorganized Latter-day Saint, or at least former reorganized Latter-day Saint, on our program. And so I'm sure that our listeners are going to be interested to hear what is the difference between the RLDS church uh, where are they based at? Um, how are they different from the Utah Mormons? And um, and maybe you could share some information on that. 
for us? Uh, yeah, that was one of the first things we were taught to <laughs> explain when we were young kids. Uh, we uh, we always uh, identified ourselves uh, as being, no, we're not Mormon. We are our LDS, reorganized Latter-day Saint. And um, I, I do remember that was um, uh, emphasized as a, as a child, and so we quickly were able to explain the difference. Uh, number one, we don't believe in polygamy and never did. The uh, RLDS church, the reorganized Latter-day Saint church, was uh, founded by uh, Joseph Smith Jr.'s son, Joseph III. Now, the Joseph Smith who founded the Mormon church was Joseph Smith Jr. <clears throat> uh, sometimes people forget that junior part. Uh, and so his son was Joseph Smith III, and uh, – the RLDS Church's uh, uh, essential beliefs was that uh, there was no um, polygamy and that Joseph Smith uh, never practiced it. And uh, his uh, wife, Emma, <clears throat> denied it publicly, taught her son that uh, it was never true, it was all a lie. Uh, and uh, so the RLDS Church identified itself that way. Secondly, not only did they not practice plural marriage, uh, but they also didn't have a temple. Now, the Mormons are a temple-building people. The Mormon church in Salt Lake City has millions, <clears throat> multiplied millions of members, probably um, uh, 15 to 17 million members, whereas the uh, RLDS church had very, very few, relatively fewer. Uh, we probably had around 200 to 250,000, about a quarter of a million members, although that number is probably down to about 200,000 at this point. Uh, so they were much uh, smaller. Third, the RLDS church did not have missionaries that went door to door. The Mormons were very well known, and almost everybody had heard about the Mormons because they had uh, missionaries in, in, in suits <clears throat> with elder so-and-so written on their name tags that went door to door proclaiming Mormonism, and the uh, RLDS did not have miss a missionary outreach. Now, very technically, they had a, an office that was called missionary. <laughs> Uh, and that was a, role, a bona fide office. I, I don't mean to make light of it, but um, they didn't have a missionary program the way that the LDS, the Mormon church, had. And then um, finally, the uh, RLDS never believed in the particular, uh, what the Mormons believe is an eternal revealed principle of the gospel, which is what they call the law of eternal progression, which is that as wow. man is, God once was, and that God, as God now is, man may become. And so the law of eternal progression, uh, I, I might unpack that later, but it claimed that God was once a man and that we can also become God if we're faithful to the uh, covenants and ordinances of the church um, of Mormonism. Now, the RLDS never believed that and never taught it. Wow. And so they did not believe in uh, this uh, principle, uh, which was critical or crucial to uh, Utah Mormonism. And so when we would talk about it, we would usually use the word Utah, the Utah Mormons, to uh, mm -hmm. distinguish ourselves. And so uh, we always had to uh, explain that. The one thing I do remember growing up as a young boy is I, I didn't like having to uh, put that long word in there, the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It seemed to be that's such a mouthful. I couldn't even, you know, other church people could say, oh, I'm Baptist or I'm Methodist or I'm Nazarene or I'm Catholic. We had to say RLDS and then say, what's that? You know, because they're just four initials. So uh, we had to give that, that, long, uh, that long explanation. Is, oh, is that so probably I, why they changed that? Is that probably why they changed their name? And could you let our listening audience know what they changed the name to? Yeah, I could. Um, the uh, RLDS Church a number of years ago went through a discussion about a change of identity, change of name, and so now they're called the Community of Christ, Community T Y uh, of Christ, and so um, they. Um, are moving in, uh, in a direction uh, that's more like uh, uh, liberal Protestantism, liberal uh, neo-Orthodox, or uh, uh, post-liberal type Protestantism. And so they, um, uh, they're moving away from the RLDS early distinctives. And uh, they're even moving away from uh, many of the things which I was raised in believing. And so I was uh, raised at a, at a juncture when the church was in a more what we would call conservative state. Uh, and it was uh, just moving towards a more liberal state uh, theologically uh, and maybe socially, too. And so uh, at that point, uh, the RLDS Church decided to move further and further away, and eventually they changed their uh, name entirely. So now they're called the Community of Christ. You know, what, what I find really intriguing, 
what I find intriguing about the Latter Day Saints and the RLDS and just the whole uh, historical break is that it is so very similar to the historical break within the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, and 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 what do you mean? Let me. Uh, and yeah, I'm about to explain that. <laughs> What's what's so similar is that Charles Hayes Russell was the founder of the International Bible Student Association, which became later known as Jehovah's Witnesses. And Charles Hayes Russell's group, the International Bible Student Association, is not quite as evangelistic or mission-oriented as what happened later on when Joseph Rutherford, after Russell died, Joseph Rutherford took off and then they split. And so the International Bible Student Association still exists today as um, still following Russell's teachings, um, very not mission-inclined, um, because just to distance themselves from the appearance of Jehovah's Witnesses. And yet oh, wow. the Jehovah's Witnesses really is a religion of Joseph Rutherford, not Charles H. Russell. They rejected pretty much most of Russell's teachings and just as in the case of the Mormon Church, the International Bible Student Association would be the more liberal view <laughs> as far as mm-hmm. schisms are concerned. And yet they're the original uh, followers of the original founder, as they have a they have a direct link to the founder, just like with the RLDS has more of a direct link to its founder. And so I think the similarities are just so amazing, just as far as, how they both have progressed as similarities. So, of course, the Utah Mormons are a much larger church than our RLDS. Am I not correct? Yes, that's true. Just those Jehovah's Witnesses are much larger than the International Bible students, right? Right. <laughs> yes. So you can see that you can see the parallels. It's very interesting parallels. Um, I hadn't even so thought I, of that quite that way before, but yes, that's very perceptive, Gus. Yes. Yeah. So uh, now I I have a question to ask now concerning about those parallels. Is there any kind of competitive nature between the two groups, that is the Utah Mormons from Brigham Young versus RLDS, saying that, well, you know, we have a direct link to Joseph Smith because his son was the founder of our church? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, Yes, there was a competitiveness. I think that competitiveness is gone. Um, Competitiveness means you're looking that each group is looking for the same piece of same territory, (laughs) or the same prize, or the same thing. And um, I think, uh, apart from the fact that that the churches, uh, in ideally, both would want to present the gospel and believe that they have a a presenting a, a message that the rest of the world needs to hear. One piece of contested territory was um, uh, an actual piece of real estate in Independence, Missouri, or as they would say back down there, Missouri, and uh, that was the Temple Lot. Um, Joseph Smith had predicted with a revelation published in one of their works of scripture called the Doctrine and Covenants that uh, a temple to the Lord would be erected in this generation. And this was one of the predictions of Joseph Smith that didn't come to pass. But if you extend the term generation to mean a very, very long period of time, much longer than 40 years, for example, then then maybe it could come true. And so the um, uh, and so the Mormons and the RLDS uh, both wanted a particular piece of territory, which Smith had dedicated to be the site for the temple, uh, and uh, they, uh, and so in that sense, yeah, there was competition among them to uh, get that piece of temple uh, area. Unfortunately, uh, after the church splintered, uh, a number of different splinter groups came up, and one of those groups was uh, called the Church of Christ Temple Lot, uh, more popularly known as the Hedrickites, named after Granville Hedrick. And uh, the Hedrickites ended up getting that piece of land while the Mormons and the RLDS both uh, tried to uh, claim it, and they both went to court uh, to try to acquire it. And apparently I I understood that the Mormons even offered the Hedrickites uh, uh, many, many years ago, like 60 or 70 million years ago, they offered them like $6 million, which was an incredibly high sum uh, for a small small area. The Church of Christ turned it down um, and still claims it, and so they have the official area. Well, then after a while, the, you know, the, the churches gave up on ever uh, hoping to uh, build uh, 
a real temple on the uh, on the registered property, and so the RLDS built their own temple, and then uh, the Mormons also have uh, temple plans in Missouri as well. Uh, so, yeah, there was uh, yes, uh, competition. Why is Missouri so important? Explain to our listeners why Missouri is so important, because I've heard that that's kind of like the Jerusalem for the Mormon church. You're you're right. Um, the Missouri is important because the um, because it was critical for the RLDS and the LDS and the revelations of Joseph Smith. Uh, the uh, originally this when I use the word saints, I'm referring to the the term of the Latter Day Saints um, yeah. during the lifetime of Joseph Smith. Uh, when that term before there was obviously a split when there was only one leader. Originally, the uh, the saints had had a large uh, kingdom in Nauvoo, Illinois, which is uh, many people have never heard of Nauvoo, N-A-U-V-O-O. Uh, that was on the Mississippi River. Um, there was a, a book uh, called Kingdom on the Mississippi written a number of years ago describing the, the Nauvoo period. Uh, uh, Nauvoo at that point in time actually was even larger than the city of Chicago. And uh, the uh, Nauvoo Legion was larger than the uh, Illinois State Militia. So. <laughs> It was quite a quite an expansive uh, area that was controlled and owned almost entirely by the um, by the Mormons. But Joseph Smith had had revelations that he was going to uh, move on uh, further. He ended up being killed there, but um, uh, his his home territory, or in one sense, what the prophetic territory was to be uh, in Missouri, not in Illinois. Uh, even though Smith was killed in Missouri, and even though he was president and mayor of, of Nauvoo at the time of his uh, assassination. Um, uh, president of Nauvoo was the wrong term. Mayor was, was the proper term. He was president yeah. of the city council. Um, so uh, why why Missouri? Because it was prophesied of the Doctrine and Covenants and that this was going to be an area. When Mormons um, and RLDS or Community of Christ members talk, they'll often use a, a key word which uh, many traditional Christians don't use. That's the word Zion. Uh, there's a, a Zionic ideal, or the, you know, the, the goal is to, is to build Zion. And what you know, we, we, we talk about Zion as a as a hope or a view or a, a vision of a new world, a vision of a world controlled by God, a vision of a world that was controlled by peace, by the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. Uh, Zionic ideals, uh, Zionic bonds, uh, uh, unlike Ionic bonds in chemistry, they are, uh, RLDS right. used to talk about Zionic bonds, and uh, uh, a Zionic rule of um, uh, was was it's it's a it's a almost a spiritual term that was uh, used in in my childhood and and certainly for many uh, many generations or years and years afterward after I uh, stopped being a child. Um, Zion is a place. In uh, now technically, very very technically, the term Zion is a hill in Jerusalem. Uh, as if people that read the Bible often hear about going up to Jerusalem, that's not because Jerusalem is north; it's because Jerusalem is elevated. Uh, it's on a hill, and that hill in Israel is called Zion, Z-I-O-N. And so, when you read in uh, in the Book of Psalms um, or in other references uh, to Zion. Zion will be redeemed and so forth. They're talking about the city of Jerusalem being redeemed. Uh, and so we talk in that right now we'll talk about Capitol Hill. And when we talk about Capitol Hill, we're not simply talking about a mountain or, you know, or, or a raised area in Washington, D.C. We're actually talking about the United States Capitol of Washington, D.C. In the same way, Zion is um, uh, both a geographic location, but it's also a spiritual term for this Jerusalem, for the temple, for the uh, headquarters, for you know, of, of uh, Israel, and for where Jesus is going to return. Now, when the Mormons uh, came along, they appropriated that term Zion not to mean a place in Israel, and the Promised Land was not going to be a place in Israel. You know, from um, the River of Egypt all the way to the Euphrates. You know, from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates River, um, or from Dan to Beersheba. It wasn't to Israel anymore. The Mormons have a new Israel, and the Book of Mormon's principle, uh, and this is a, a key for people that may not be familiar with it, is that the Book of Mormon prophesies that there's going to be a new promised land. 
and that the promised land given in the Old Testament promises to the people of Israel, to the children of Israel is the name for Abraham, Isaac, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For Jacob's third, you know, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, um, and then Israel became the father of the twelve tribes, and then Israel became a synonym for the land, the territory. Um, that promised land was transferred over to North America. And so when the Book of Mormon came out, the New Promised Land, according to the Book of Mormon, is North and South America. And then the New Promised Land, uh, particularly, uh, the headquarters of the Promised Land is Zion. And Zion is in Jackson County, Missouri, yeah. uh, specifically Independence. Uh, and so the Mormons um, and the RLDS believe that, that Zion is going to be a place where uh, when the temple is built, the law of God will go forth from out of that temple in Jackson County, Missouri, uh, and that that uh, place will be a place of peace and a place where the kingdom of God will uh, begin and then eventually overspread uh, overspread the earth. So is, is, isn't then that temple lot critical for that fulfillment, or as long as they have a temple in independence, it's, it's, that'll work? <laughs> well, uh, it used to be critical, but there have been adjustments <laughs> to yeah. handle the reality of the situation. <laughs> and right. the reality of the situation is that they're not going to get that piece of territory. And so what they have to do is they uh, find the next best thing. And so they uh, maybe say, well, we, maybe we, we have to reinterpret or re-understand what the temple uh, is all about. And so uh, many years ago, the RLDS decided that they would build their temple it wouldn't have special rituals like the Mormons have. When the Mormons have a temple, they actually have rituals that go on there. One of those is temple marriage, uh, a marriage which is for both time and eternity. What does that mean? Right. Uh, well, in most marriages, people are married till death do you part. You know, uh, that's for marriage for time. Marriage for eternity means uh, that uh, the person continues to have marriage bonds, bonds of covenant marriage, even <coughs> into eternity. Wait a minute. I thought that Jesus said that's, you know, what did Jesus say? He said in heaven there will be no marrying or giving right. in marriage. That's why we have to do it on earth. It reminds well, we me of the song, like, in heaven there is no beer, that's why we drink it here. <laughs> right. Well, we will be like the angels. That's what Jesus said. We will be like yes, the angels. Yes, he said they will be like the angels uh, in heaven, yeah. you know, because there is no marrying or giving in marriage in that kingdom, in the kingdom of God. And so that's why they believe that if there's going to be anything done, it has to be done here on earth. In heaven, there's also no baptism. Uh, and that's why the Mormons believe that you have to baptize here uh, on earth for that, for that to take now, place. Now, the, the, so the RLDS, do they still hold to that eternal marriage uh, viewpoint? Because they, they den you said they denied the doctrine of eternal progression, right? Oh, no, they never did. They never, ever uh, held to it. Um, now, Joseph Smith, I believe, practiced it. <laughs> but right. I don't believe that the – not that I don't believe, I am positive that the RLDS uh, never believed that it was uh, true. Uh, in the very, very earliest days of the church, um, uh, meaning in 1860 when it was founded in Amboy, Illinois, and, uh, and Beloit, Wisconsin um, – uh, in the very earliest days of the church, where there was an early copy of a periodical called the True Latter-day Saints Herald, uh, which they claimed that they were the true Latter-day Saints, the false Latter-day Saints were the ones in Utah. Um, and in the very earliest first places, they did, uh, the first issue does say that Joseph Smith uh, had uh, accepted false doctrines, and that false doctrines were literally taught by Joseph Smith, but he was uh, being deceived and deluded by uh, malicious other parties, and that therefore they they believe that Smith basically was a fallen prophet, or that he fell into error the remaining years of his life, and they were going to return to the doctrines that Joseph Smith taught earlier in his wow, life. Wow, that's significant. That's very significant, especially coming from a descendant, you know, his son. From the sun. Yeah, now, well, um, just, here's what happened. And uh, within, a, within probably a year or so, uh, those statements uh, disappeared, and they uh, no longer taught, and so by 1861 maybe, uh, they no longer claimed that Joseph Smith uh, fell into error. Uh, there was always the claim that Smith was a pure and you know, true man uh, throughout the entirety of his life. Uh, so there was a, a period 
at which there was that, that error. Nice. Well, that's interesting because um, I was thinking that, uh, well, you know, the Utah Mormons have such a very, very high view of, of Smith uh, Jr., Joseph Smith Jr. Um, uh-huh. You know, he's, I mean, they, they herald him as the greatest prophet that has ever been on the earth and that his ministry is, even, you know, I think the equivalent or if not more important than even Jesus Christ's ministry. Um, but um, uh, so Joseph Smith III, now knowing that Joseph Smith Jr. had so many different wives, um, I, I would think Emma Smith was probably his first or was that uh, his Emma Smith one? was his first and only legal wife. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so so then, that, that, so then that's why Smith the Third gets the nod. <laughs> yes. Um, here was uh, and here was a, a thing which I think that was difficult for people to cope with. What about these claims of other wives uh, that yeah. Joseph Smith had? Now everyone knows, and, you know, at least everyone familiar with Mormonism would know that polygamy was fully accepted in Salt Lake City, Utah, after the Mormons wound up there. And just for the people that are listeners that are not familiar, Joseph Smith was the prophet of the Mormon Church. Mormon Church went from six people, six official members, in 1830, April 6th, was when the church was founded in Fayetteville, New York, uh, to over 20,000, uh, 20 even, uh, some estimates they would 30,000 followers by 1844. That's in 14 years. In right. 14 years you go from, I mean, there's a lot of people that would love to have a church grow to 14,000 people in 14 right. years, or 20,000 people in 14 years. I mean, that's incredible without television, without radio, without mass, you know, how do they do it? And it was a message that uh, struck uh, an itch in a lot of people's minds at a, lot, at a long, long time. And so the church grew to these incredibly large, fast, uh, numbers. Well, I was that was a diversion quickly, but uh, so you've got twenty, thirty thousand people that happened. So at the time of eighteen forty four, uh, Smith uh, was being exposed uh, for uh, his uh, spiritual wife doctrines, which was basically an attempt to um, seduce women. Uh, in the eighteen forties, there was still a very conservative part. Of, uh, Christ- of Christianity in the United States. Uh, women were not involved in the sexual revolution. They were still pretty careful and cautious, and although there's always been a, an area of immorality, this was a pretty conservative country. Right. And so women wouldn't go to bed with men unless they were married to them. Joseph Smith, therefore, created a spiritual life doctrine that we are married and in his attempts, which I believe were actually attempts at adultery, um, mm. uh, he approached women and created a doctrine that they would be spiritually married to him. And I believe that this was simply a ruse in order to allow uh, him to commit adultery with them because they wouldn't have done right. that otherwise. There has to be some kind of a thing. That, and these were women that were uh, already married to other men at that time. Some of uh, members and leaders of the church. <laughs> and so the plural marriage or polygamy was actually a more of an attempt of, at adultery rather than a, a dumb theological law that they believed that needed to be revealed later on. Uh, so Joseph Smith's uh, view on a plural marriage, when he died, that um, uh, teaching was going out uh, to uh, people. As a matter of fact, there was a uh, a newspaper called the Nauvoo Expositor. It only existed in one issue, and it revealed some of Joseph Smith's uh, practices. You can call that plural marriage practice. It revealed some of that and also some other elements that were distasteful. Uh, they had ex-members of the church who were writing the Nauvoo Expositor, uh, Mayor Joseph Smith plus the Nauvoo City Council declared that that newspaper was a nuisance. They ordered it to be destroyed. And so uh, the uh, police went out and uh, tore the newspaper uh, apart and threw all the you know, parts away. Uh, after that news got out that this had been done, citizens of Illinois uh, felt that Smith had violated the First Amendment of the Constitution, which is freedom of the press, which is true, he had. 
And so uh, attempts were made to uh, bring just so, so Joseph Smith to justice. And so Smith was, uh, in one sense, uh, running from, uh, even though he had a legion of people with him militarily, there were also elements that would come in and and, uh, and try to do him harm. So he was technically in uh, uh, flight. Uh, then he was taken into protect, protective custody, is the way that we were always told the story, in Carthage, right. Illinois, until he could be tried formally. Uh, but he knew that in Carthage he was outside of his territory, and uh, at that time he was assassinated uh, by a mob that attacked uh, the jail because uh, you know they were strongly anti-Mormon. They were anti-Mormon for many other reasons, but not just a polygamous issue, but because it was this, you know so they it was a false prophet. They believed uh, the Book of Mormon was false. Pardon me. It's safe to say that his polygamous ways was his downfall. Uh, that was that was probably one of it, uh, one one major part of it. But this claimed to be the one true church. I mean, that was very offensive to people that believed that salvation was through Jesus Christ alone, and not through right. joining a church. But his view was that this is the only true and living church upon the face of the earth, with which the Lord God was well pleased. And so uh, the um, uh, claimed that the uh, other churches didn't have authority to preach the gospel, which was in, indoctrinated into their own book of doctrine and covenants as a, as revelation. The other churches didn't have the right to baptize. Only his church had the right to baptize. Other churches didn't have the right to administer sacred ordinances, which would be communion. Uh, only his church had the right to do that. This particularly proud exclusivist religion had come on the scene was uh, essentially sh- sheep stealing, taking people out from existing Christian churches, and they're converting to that form called Mormonism. Um, and many people just found that uh, highly offensive, as, long as, as, as well as the fact that they believed that his revelations were false uh, and, his, and his doctrine was, was not true. And so they, people would be uh, angry at the Mormons even if there was absolutely no um, issues of plural marriage, just as people were, say, angry at Jehovah's Witnesses even though right. Jehovah's Witnesses have never committed polygamy, <laughs> and right. you know, at least to the best of my knowledge anyway, uh, that people were angry at Jehovah's Witnesses believe it because they taught the false doctrine. And so um, there was some antipathy towards Joseph already. Uh, at any, when he was assassinated um, in 1844, it was in June, um, then the, the next question was, what's going to happen to all the people that are in this church? Uh, well, uh, Brigham Young took about 10,000 people from uh, Missouri and Illinois area to Salt Lake uh, City, Utah. Uh, and that was a great trek west that took, occurred in 1846. They didn't want to go during winter, but they did have to cross some winter months as well. Um, that was a, uh, uh, in Salt Lake City, they were able to practice polygamy openly because it was a territory, it was in state. And so uh, in, uh, at, that, at that time, they had freedom to practice their religions uh, as, as well as they wanted. But in, at least in the early years, um, uh, in, in public view of uh, newspapers and uh, authorities, they, uh, they, they couldn't practice that as, as openly. I think we have uh, another, uh, another topic. <laughs> Sorry, talking okay. so long. No, 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 that's good. Um, so um, is, is, is this probably why the, and, and most of our listening audience doesn't know that in Utah is also another group called the Fundamentalist Latter Day Saints. I guess, I guess they are a LDS schism, um, not a RLDS schism. And um, yes, they are. Yeah, they're an LDS schism, and um, and so um, they they practice polygamy openly over there, don't they? And it must be like a territory, I think. Well, one one thing that helps is Utah is, is a very desert condition. Yeah. I would imagine that taking 10,000 people there must have been really, really tough at the time. And nobody wanted to live there because nothing really grows out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could see. Um, let me give it's, you a quick It's almost, uh, like, quick it's almost like the, yeah. the reservations that, that they put the Indians on. The reservations, they, you know, they gave the Indians land and they called it reservations, but that land was worthless. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so, uh, that's, so is, that, that's, yeah. is that why they were not pursued, I guess? 
Well, uh, that's true. I mean, but but especially uh, Utah didn't even obtain uh, statehood until much later. And I'm, I, I'm, I want to say 1910, but I don't think that was it. I think it was probably yeah, 1890, uh, 1890, because they did have the manifesto occurred in 1890, which forbade the practice of polygamy. That was one of the uh, uh, revelations of the Doctrine and Covenants. I guess we'll talk about that if we don't mind switching over uh, to the issues of revelations. Joseph Smith was uh, a prophet, a seer, and a revelator. The prophet meaning he could predict the future. The seer meaning that he had the ability to see things which were invisible to the natural eye. He had the ability to see the, uh, particularly the writing on the Urim and Thummim, which translated the Book of Mormon. And the um, revelator so, oh, he received revelation oh, from I, God. I, I, I hate to give you pause right there. But, so he claimed to have the Urim and Thummim in, uh, from the Old Testament? Uh, yes. Uh, in the Old Testament, you'll find these two words called Urim, U-R-I-M, and Thummim, T-H-U-M-M-I-M. Those are both plurals. All words that end in I-M are plural uh, nouns in Hebrew. And so cherubim and seraphim, those are plurals. Uh, but the uh, Urim and Thummim were referred to uh, as being in the possession of the high priest, uh, and uh, were kept within the ephod, E-T-H-O-D, the ephod of the uh, uh, breastplate, inside the breastplate of the high priest's garments. And the Urim and the Thummim, uh, very little is indicated about them, except uh, that uh, they mean, uh, the word Urim and Thummim means lights, and uh, uh, lights, and I right now I forget the other one, uh, <laughs> so funny, I used to say uh, perfections. That's right, lights and perfections. Um, those uh, are not referred to very much, but the, in the Mormon uh, teaching and Joseph Smith's teaching, the Urim and Thummim were actually stones that were used in with, uh, that helped people to translate from one language to another. Now, logically, right now, the way we learn translation is we learn by learning the languages. If you were bilingual, maybe you speak English and Spanish, or you might speak English right. and French, or you know, uh, multiple languages. Uh, you uh, learn by uh, going to those countries or having a teacher or someone teach you those languages. But Joseph Smith uh, didn't have that opportunity, and he believed uh, and taught um, that those two uh, objects uh, could be used for translating languages and that actually uh, characters would appear in the stones in uh, visible light, kind of, you know, as if, if you were a kid, maybe you saw the little eight ball and you'd shake the eight ball and, you, <laughs> you know, there was a toy. Uh, and words would appear on the bottom of this uh, eight ball plastic uh, plastic toy, well, uh, uh, or kind of like a crystal ball. And in actual fact, this was a divinatory practice, a practice of divination, which is technically called scrying or crystal gazing. And mm -hmm. Smith uh, believed that the uh, Urim and Thummim were crystals or uh, crystal ball-like objects, and that lights would appear within them, which would form themselves into characters and words by the power of God uh, that would enable him to translate things which were unknown. And so instead of learning a language or deciphering a language, which is what you would do if you didn't have anyone to teach you, uh, the Urim and the Thummim would present the uh, translation supernaturally. Uh, no, 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 I, no, I definitely wanted to hear that because I, I guess that's, what is referred to as the seer stone that I've, I've heard that he would put into a hat. And, uh, oh, yeah. We were actually going yeah. with the place with the, with the prophets uh, and the prophecy, and you were talking about Warren Jeffs and so forth. Okay. Right, so Smith right. was a prophet, a seer, and a revelator. And uh, officially, when people are ordained to the presidency of the churches, they were also ordained to the same office of prophet, seer, and revelator. The one thing you asked, well, and I, I touched on this a little bit earlier, is about how the church grew so quickly. And even for the Mormon church, you know, the, L the LDS church, why did they grow so quickly? They had people like Joseph Smith and uh, Brigham Young. And although our church never, our LDS church never had Brigham Young, you know, Brigham Young is referred to the, by the Mormons as the Lion of the Lord. And these were men that when they spoke, they spoke as the very oracles of God. Uh, they didn't just speak as people who had an opinion because I'm an opinionated person, okay, <laughs> and, you know, maybe other people are too, and other people have uh, their views on truth, and other people say, I'm convinced that what I'm telling you is the absolute truth. I swear to God it's the truth, and, and I testify before you in the name of Jesus Christ, and so we will even testify to the truth. Right. But Joseph Smith and Brigham Young went a notch higher. 
it was ratcheted up one additional or two additional clicks. And it wasn't just that I'm telling you the truth. This is that God has shown me the truth and revealed it not just to me, but to the rest of the world. And I declare this to you in the name of the Lord. And they assumed a prophetic mantle. They took on this prophetic word. When you read the revelations in the uh, Doctrine and Covenants, which is their book of revelations uh, from Joseph Smith and others, mostly Joseph Smith, you see this, this, this power, this particular kind of authority of new doctrine coming forth. It doesn't have to have any precedent at all. It doesn't need any prior revelation to, you know, scoop it up or give it, give it you know, status. It, it, it stands essentially on its own. It's not an administrative, you know, teaching. It's actually the verbatim words of God, thus saith the Lord thy God unto thee. Um, uh, when you read the other revelations of, say, the RLDS church or even the LDS church that have come forth later, they're uh, milk toast in comparison. They're administrative. This is what I feel the Spirit is saying at the present time. And, uh, you know, uh, my goodness, it's like uh, it's, it's like all the difference between eating rotten cabbage and a steak dinner. <laughs> there is a, yeah, well, um, I mean, a power we, we, in, those, in those revelations. And there wasn't those that, in, in Brigham Young, too. Yeah, we, we see that type of charisma and confidence even within the body of Christ, within the church. I mean, we see it mm-hmm. um, specifically more within Pentecostal circles. Um the name it and claim it type of uh, circles where, you know, you have a uh, you have a large following, first of all, like, uh, let's say, a Creflo Dollar, you can get away with a lot more with, with your confidence. I mean, mm-hmm. and, and you already have a large following. People already believe in what you have to say. And uh, so I guess, and, you know, word of mouth spreads after that, you know, this, uh, this man of God spoke and he spoke. Oh, you know, and so in the time where skepticism was probably was not really rampant, uh, I guess spiritual deceit was definitely rampant in the 1800s. Um, uh, people were more susceptible to, uh, I guess, a man with a lot of confidence. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of confidence, and then I think what happened for Mormonism, the question is, why did it grow so quickly? What brought it about? I think a couple things. Um one of them was was that people were prepared spiritually uh, for that revelation. Uh, let me give you just a couple of uh, ideas. Number one, I, we touched on this. We did touch on it earlier about these strong revelations. One of the marks of cults is they usually have an authoritarian leader, a uh, person who speaks with dynamic and powerful authority. They don't have like a milk toast leader or someone who's you know, uh, invisible in the background or who's mealy mouth or who isn't able to, you know, not just stand up but, but put forth this word. Um, but secondly, the question is, are they answering things that people want to know right now? What are the crucial right. and core issues? If you study Jehovah's Witnesses, there are some core issues. Well, what about the Trinity? What about, you know, um, uh, the, uh, the end times? And the Jehovah's Witnesses came out of a, of a movement when the, there was a question, speculation about what about the end of, uh, the, end of the age and when is Christ going to return? Uh, and uh, what about 1914? <laughs> because it's just on the cusp of the World War I. Well, Mormonism came at a time when there was also a lot of questions. And those questions concerned other things like, for example, um, where did the Native Americans come from, which were back then were called American Indians? Um, were they were they, were they always pagan or, or were they always you know heathen or did they ever have uh, uh, history and, and what about God's love for the entire world? The Book of Mormon um, originally appeared as only uh, chapters, no verses, and it told a story that answered a lot of questions that people wanted to know, and they mm-hmm. answered them with definitiveness. And one of them was was that the American Indians were really Jewish. Mm-hmm. that they weren't simply a, a pagan people, that they were actually another uh, people. And then the other question is related to it, well, does Jesus really love the whole world? You know, what, do we sing this is my father's world? Well, doesn't he just love the people that lived in the Eastern Hemisphere? And um, we were taught that God loved the whole world, and the Book of Mormon is a message that God sent his revelators, his prophets, throughout all the world, not just part of the right. world. 
So one of the questions is, what about the heathen? What about people that never heard the gospel, never had an opportunity? You know, we still have that question today. How is God going to deal right. with, the, with people that have never heard? And the Book of Mormon's answer was, but they have heard. Okay. Uh, because God sent out prophets and apostles to them, and that Jesus Christ personally, and get this right, personally visited North America in the flesh. <laughs> that there was a North American civilization, a Christian civilization set up that lasted over a hundred years where people were worshiping Jesus Christ and being baptized in his name thousands of years before Columbus. And so we have a Christian civilization on this continent uh, and that we have prophets and we have apostles, and then but people fell into sin. But what about the different skin color? Oh, yeah, that skin color issue. Well, that is a mark that, uh, that God put upon them when they transgressed. And so uh, Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon taught that this, you know, that the Lamanites, which was their term for the American Indians, um, uh, received the skin of darkness when they fell away from God. Uh, Joseph Smith uh, did additional revelations, and uh, he also corrected the Bible. And the Bible that I was raised with was uh, called uh, the inspired version of the Holy Scriptures, corrected by the Spirit of Revelation by Joseph Smith. So I happen to have that book in my hand as I'm talking to you right now. And uh, in my Bible, which is not in your Bible, what, although this particular Bible goes from Genesis to Revelation, it says that the mark on Cain was a mark on blackness. Canaan uh, was to be uh, black, that the curse of Canaan, which was the son of Ham, uh, was a skin of blackness, that the mark that God put on Cain, uh, who killed Abel, uh, was also a uh, black skin. And so uh, that's the explanation for the different races. What about the explanation for, what about baptism and things like that? Well, the Book of Mormon claims, and also the uh, Book of Genesis in, in, in my Bible, <laughs> says that uh, baptism isn't needed until you reach the age of accountability. As a matter of fact, in uh, in Genesis, uh, in uh, I was just looking at the different things that I was raised in believing. It's in Genesis uh, 17 uh, uh, that uh, God uh, told Abraham, "Quote: uh, I will establish my covenant of circumcision with thee, and it is my covenant between thee and thy seed after thee, that thou mayest know us forever. The children are not accountable before me until they are eight years old." Huh? Wow. <laughs> and so, you know, and so it sounds very scriptural. What a stretch. God talking to Abraham about circumcision, right? And Smith believed that uh, the book, that he needed to add that part to correct the Bible. And so wow. the question is, because people always ask, well, if, I, if my children die, and there was high infant mortality in those days, if my children die, will I see them again? Uh, uh, I don't know. Are they baptized? Some people would, would ask, and the Roman Catholic Church had this doctrine of limbo to kind of deal with that issue, but Protestants right. don't accept the doctrine of limbo, so what do Protestants have? Uh, well, we just have a hope that Jesus Christ would suffer the little children to come to me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven, you know. We have maybe right. David's words, you know, uh, that he shall not go unto me, but I shall go to him. So David expected to go to see his young son who died in infancy. We don't have anything right. that's clearer well, the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith said, no, we, we do have something clearer than the Bible. We have revelation, you know, directly from God. The children are not accountable till the age of eight. And as a matter of fact, the Book of Mormon claims that if you believe the children need baptism, then you are in the bonds of iniquity and that Satan has darkened your heart. Uh, and so the Book of Mormon answered other questions. You know, like what about universalism? Now, it's, uh, in the time of the Book of Mormon uh, coming forth, there was a, a theory that a lot of people would be saved, that the entire, you know, the whole world would be saved uh, through the revelation of Christ. Uh, is that yeah, true? I, the Book of Mormon says no. <laughs> I, 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 find I find that Book significant. Very clearly. I, find that, I find that significant because it seems like, and, and me having become a Christian, I've become satisfied with areas of mystery in my faith. And, um, and to know that to acknowledge that there are areas of mystery in my faith and that those things will be clarified when I go to be with God. And and I think that the cults, and whether it's the Mormon Church or the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Seventh-day Adventists, so on and et cetera, are obsessed, obsessed with satisfying answers and there being no mystery to have an answer for every single detail. And um, once I, I think um, Matthias accused uh, 
I think it was, I was speaking to an atheist about, and they were saying that Christianity claims to have all the answers. I said, no, I, I find that to be the opposite of the case, that since I've left, you know, the cult, and we were both former Jehovah's Witnesses discussing this, since I've left the Jehovah's Witnesses and have become a Christian, that actually that as a Christian and what Christianity espouses is that there will be elements of mystery in our faith and that that's why it's part of it. It's called faith. Faith is means, you know, uh, you know, sure, we have propositional truths, but part of that faith is trusting. You know, uh, the, the reformers called it fiducia. And, uh, mm-hmm. and so I trust, I trust in God. I'm like a little child in that aspect that I come to God as a little child knowing that I don't know it all and that I rely upon God and his omniscience to resolve that one day when I meet him. And mm-hmm. as, so as a Christian, I... For example, I don't really hold. I, I may, I may lean toward a particular eschatological view, but I don't really hold to any, es, you know, eschatology really strong. I'm not a dispensationalist. Uh, left behind, like some people, just a staunch into one position. But um, I always say I'm a pan-millennialist. God is going to pan mm-hmm. it all out, and and so yeah. you know, there are elements of my faith that I acknowledge. You know what? I don't know, but I know God's going to sort it out when I see him, and he's going to sort us all out on the on those little things that I don't know about or anybody else who claims to think that they know about. And so there is a realm of mystery in our faith and that, you know, in a sense that we should be satisfied with trusting in God and that he has the answer. And I think and I think Job's account is an excellent example of that, you know, you know, Job, you know, he claims to think that he knows it all, you know. Yeah, I know this, you know. And Job, being a righteous man, you know, he, he wasn't trying to offend God, but God says to mm-hmm. Job, you don't even know when you're going to die. He <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so you know. And Job is awestruck when God shows up. He can't say a thing. He's, he's like uh, he's like uh, Costello and, you know, Bud Abbott and, and Costello. You know, he's just left with his yep, mouth yep, yep. going, Abba, 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 Abba. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, I think that that's, that's one of the pleasantries of real, authentic Christianity is that we're satisfied with not knowing it all. Some may claim to know it all, and usually the cults are always claiming to know it absolutely all to the details uh, and can only work within the realm of human logic or human fantasy, and that's what we hear. Um, happening right now, um, I want to I want to get to your testimony because you you have four generations of uh, so I would imagine do you have any of your are you the only one that has left the RLDS church in your family? In my immediate family, uh, no. Uh, actually, uh, I I got saved after about two years after I got saved. My parents got saved, and then my parents um, uh, left the church in mass. Uh, with uh, all my brothers and sisters, and so at the time wow. of our uh, uh, conversion, we uh, uh, God just put things in the right place at the right time for us, and uh, so my immediate family uh, has all left the RLDS church, but That's our awesome. extended families, which include uh, uncles and cousins and so forth, are still our LDS members, or else have, have passed away. So then, uh, being a fourth generation, then I guess that would be your grandparents. Were the ones who converted, or was it your great grandparents? Uh, it was all on my father's side on, on the fourth generation. My mother was raised a, a Methodist, and she converted to the RLDS church when she met my dad uh, yeah. as uh, a, a young woman of 18 or 19 years old. And he brought her into the RLDS church, and she accepted, and she was baptized, and, and she raised us in that faith after, uh, you know. Um, and she'd been an RLDS member for a, a while and, and had believed uh, that message. Uh, but on my father's side, my father, my father's father, and, and my great-grandfather were all, all in the organized Latter-day Saint church. Wow. So you, so your dad is the real apostate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That's yeah, amazing. Said, you know, so, so um, how was it, I mean, what, uh, you know, was it all of a sudden the entire family now embraced, you know, mainstream Christianity, or 
What was it that, this is really now beyond your testimony, what was it that caused your dad to question the, his heritage? Okay, with, uh, I guess I can, I can tell the story in this order. Um, I, I, I became a Christian first. Uh, and my testimony is something I'll get to in a minute. But what happened is, is uh, after I got saved, um, and my parents recognized that I was a different person, uh, and I immediately wanted them to start going to um, uh, Christian churches. And I think this is really the work of God. At the time that I got saved, uh, at the very same time, my father was a, a civilian employee for the U.S. Department of Defense, and he'd worked there for over 20 years. Um, uh, the U.S. Department of Defense was closing down one of its facilities where my father worked at, and there were uh, practically no other places to move, you know, uh, to work. Uh, the entire plant was being closed down. And so his only option was uh, to move entirely across the state, or we did have an option to move out of the country. He would get a raise if we moved out of the country. My mother said, no, we are not going to Taiwan, <laughs> you know, because that's too far. Well, I will never see any of my friendly uh, family again. And so there was a, um, a job opening uh, at Rock Island, Illinois, for the Rock Island Armament Command. Uh, they called it ARMCOM back then. And uh, so my father worked for the government, and so uh, he transferred to Rock Island. Uh, at, uh, and so we had to buy a house, and moved, you know, we lost all of our friends. All of our friends and family members were, you know, in uh, rural Illinois, where we were at. Um, and uh, our church history, our heritage, and all my friends. And when we moved to Rock Island, none of us knew anyone. <laughs> well, an interesting thing happened, though, was I had just gotten saved. And so when I became a, a Christian believer, and I realized that there were true believers uh, all over, uh, not simply in my denomination, but uh, there were people that knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, uh, that and that the gospel wasn't connected to an organization like a church or a prophet, but it was connected to the word of God in the Bible, you know, that if, if you read the Bible, the Bible contains the gospel. The gospel right. is the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe. Um, right. and it offers eternal life to whoever will come to Jesus Christ and repent of their sins and trust in him. And it's not something that had to be uh, hidden or restored by Joseph Smith because we always claim that we had the restored gospel. A whole new world opened up to me when we moved to the Quad Cities. Quad Cities are Rock Island um, and Moline in Illinois and then Devonport and Bettendorf in Iowa. They're just across the Mississippi River from each other. We moved to this new uh, area, and I, uh, an opportunity was there that we can now change churches <laughs> because normally my parents would have gone to the RLDS church in Moline, Illinois. But I thought, well, let's go find a church that, you know, preaches the gospel and where the people are on fire and filled with the Holy Spirit and where they know God and where they live according to the Bible. And, and they, preach, they preach, you know, with, with conviction, with the Holy Spirit, with much assurance. Uh, and so I looked for some churches that did that, that preached the gospel, and, and I found uh, uh, one or two um, that I could bring my parents to. And so we actually did try going to the uh, uh, RLDS congregation in uh, the Quad Cities. But the truth is, it's deadly dull. Uh, and the message that we were raised with believing and, and the message to kind of like my father, uh, you know, raised us with, it kind of, it was a, kind of a pablum gospel. You know, be nice to animals, pay your taxes, be a good person, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven, which that's the words of Jesus and so forth. But there, there wasn't a transformative work of God in, uh, and there wasn't, uh, in any sense, an in-depth Bible study uh, in our in our denomination. It just wasn't there. Wow. You know that's interesting Whereas, because because the the LDS Church is kind of the exact opposite. They claim to be very experiential, um, and when you hear Mormon missionaries, whether it's uh, sisters or elders, and I've had them both at my house. Um, first of all, the women seem to be completely in love and enamored with Joseph Smith Jr. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've had them fawning in front of me, and me and my wife were looking at it, and we were like, can you check her out? Look at her. You know, we were like, wow, look at how she's – it's like if he was alive today, she was just fawning over this man. And, um, and uh, 
And then the, the you know, the, but the, this idea of getting this burning in the bosom and the spirit. And I, I remember I, I was speaking to a Mormon elder, and he, he invited me to come to a baptism. He said the spirit was so strong, and and it was seemed so experiential. And um, and he was talking about okay. how the Holy Spirit was present there. Um, but I guess the, the our LDS kind of different because the LDS seemed to be very experiential. Okay, well, maybe I, I, I don't want to overstate that uh, that issue because there, there definitely is that component in the RLDS church, too. There, there is a strong experiential view, and we were raised with testimonies and visions and healings. But I remember, you know, testifying on, 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 at prayer and testimony meeting myself as, as a young child, believing, I, you know, and I think that God had done this through his common grace, you know, of, of healing within the RLDS church when the elders came and anointed me with oil of the RLDS church. And uh, I'd fallen off the, down the stairway and cracked my head against the cement floor, and uh, there was concern about how what, how it's going to wind up. And so they called the elders of church and had them pray for me. And I, you know, uh, there are other people in the RLDS church who uh, have much stronger testimonies of having seen uh, visions of angels and uh, having the uh, three Nephites come to them. Uh, three Nephites is a oh. special term that's used within the RLDS and the LDS groups uh, of having. Uh, Strong, strong uh, experiences of visions and dreams which came true, and if, you know uh, a dream in which someone says uh, tomorrow uh, someone bringing the truth will come to your door, and it turns out that uh, RLDS missionary comes to the door the very next day, for example, things, things stories like that. And so yeah, we did have right. uh, that component, I, guess, I would say, in that. But uh, it's just that the uh, the church teachings themselves were just very boring. You would find an occasional perp- uh, person who, um, you know, had uh, strong convictions. But I think uh, my parents were wanting to hear the the gospel, the Bible. We were wanting to hear biblical teaching, I think. I think there was a hunger. My parents definitely saw a change in me. And anyway, I'll get to the point. Is uh, I, I exposed my parents to other churches. I said, well, let's try going here for a couple times. And my parents started going to there. And they said, well, that's really not so bad. Um, then something else happened. Um, then I left and moved out of house. Uh, I was uh, I, I'd been uh, going to school at a local uh, community college. I was in my second year of college, and uh, I moved away from home suddenly and decided to become a missionary. I won't go all, into all the details, but it, it really surprised my parents, and uh, they really wanted to know, man, what has come over our son that he is so gung ho for Jesus Christ and he wants to go and you know. And I remember having a conversation with my dad, and and uh, you know, my dad started talking about theology and things like that. He didn't know anything about it, but um, he, um, you know, I said, Dad, can you name a single Christian leader that's ever, ever had any effect on your life whatsoever? And uh, the truth is, no. My dad, you know, he, he sang barbershop quartet music, and he was, uh, you know, he was an okay guy, but he also he had a bad temper. You know, he just, he was a very worldly man that was raised in a church that uh, didn't have uh, the power to change his heart or change his life. Uh, he was raised in a church which had a message uh, and uh, which had uh, stories of uh, Joseph Smith and angels and visions and blessings and uh, signs and, and so forth of the Book of Mormon and other things. But uh, he, uh, he still had an unregenerate heart, a heart that didn't know God. He had a life, uh, an anger problem, um, and uh, a sin problem. He had a lot of sin in his life uh, that I won't go into. He is my dad. Uh, he's, he's with the Lord now, and he um, he just uh, realized that uh, he's somewhat far from God. So wow. after I moved out, my parents started going to traditional churches. They decided that the RLDS church wasn't preaching uh, a normal gospel. Uh, they didn't have exactly know what else it was that they were looking for, but at least I had directed them in a different way. Also, they were listening to a Moody affiliate station. Moody Bible Institute has a a radio broadcast ministry called the Moody Broadcasting, and they have broadcast affiliates all over the country. And there was a Moody affiliate in uh, our area, as WDLM stands for Dwight L. Moody. And uh, my father would go to work and then come back, and he would listen to the radio as he's on his uh, 45-minute drive to work every day. And uh, he uh, listened to this pastor, Pastor Donald Cole, uh, and he really liked listening to Pastor Donald Cole, and then he would listen to this other fellow named J. Vernon McGee, and they seemed uh, to really know the Bible. 
he listened to them yeah. for months and months and months and years. And yeah. uh, one day as my dad was uh, driving home, uh, it was actually Pastor Donald Cole of uh, WDLM that uh, was going through the book of Romans. And he was in Romans chapter 3 um, about the person who was justified by faith before God. Yeah. And as, he, as Pastor Cole was expound, explaining what the book of Romans is talking about in terms of salvation, what, that salvation is not something that we do or we earn or we deserve or that we're baptized into or that we're joining, but it's a gift of God entirely yeah. free. You can't buy it, not even by being a nice person, not even by keeping the commandments. When we were in the RLDS church, it was keeping the commandments was their way of salvation. You know, he, yeah. he does righteousness, and, you know, as a matter of fact, Joseph Smith had went ahead and changed the Bible. Uh, I mentioned that he altered his version of the Bible many places, Well, one of the places he altered it also was, you know, uh, that people are justified by faith and works. <laughs> so yeah. he talked, uh, so that we were, we were taught this very strong commandment-keeping path to salvation. But the real Bible is just, but they we're justified freely by his grace. And uh, as Pastor Cole was coming down to Romans chapter, uh, and, and my father has told me the story personally, and he also had the privilege of telling it to Pastor Cole himself uh, wow. several years after his conversion, Pastor That's Cole awesome. came across this verse in Romans 3.23. It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And my father knew that he had sinned. Uh, but the Bible says in the next verse, being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We're not justified by earning his grace. We're justified freely with, as a gift, not as something that's deserved by his grace, through the redemption in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. The anger of God, the wrath of God, the hell that we deserve is forgiven because of faith in his blood, not because of the works of our hand, not because of our enduring to the end, not because we've been a righteous person, but through faith in his blood, not keeping his commandments, to declaring his righteousness that God forgives us for the remission of sins. And as that came across the airways, my father says he just broke down in tears, and he just kept repeating it over and over again. He was driving home from the Rock Island Armament Command <laughs> on, on an interstate that I've driven a number of times. He's driving right. on the interstate 70 miles an hour. Uh, he just kept repeating, I didn't know. I didn't know. Wow. I didn't know. And suddenly it hit him like, like, a, like a fist, like a load of bricks, that we're not saved by keeping the commandments to side freely by faith in his blood, not by trusting in our works. And suddenly it became clear to him that salvation is a gift of God. He had always, you know, kept felt that he couldn't make it exactly. You know, the RLDS church did one thing. They did have this doctrine that you can even be an unrepentant adulterer, whoremonger, liar, or thief and still wind up in what they call celestial glory. And that, see, they, they have a, a more liberal view of people who go to, go to heaven than, than most Christians do. Uh, both the RLDS church and the LDS church have this view that, um, that perfect people will uh, end up becoming, going to celestial glory. Well, they'll be with God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit forever. But even if you're a, mostly a good person, but you've committed some sins, then you'll go to terrestrial glory, which is like the glory of the uh, moon. And then if, even if you're a bad person and you're an unrepentant adulterer, whoremonger, liar, or thief who dies in their sins, uh, uh, and also whoever loves and makes a lie, they will go to celestial glory, which they'll be with the Holy Spirit forever. They might not see God the Father, and they might not see Jesus, but they will see the Holy Spirit forever. And so the RLDS Church and the LDS Church in their Book of Doctrine and Covenants have this you know, wide view that an awful lot of people will make it. But the Bible says that we have to have faith in Jesus Christ to be saved, and that, sal and that salvation is not as a result of works, but it's a gift of God. And anyway, my Amen. father uh, listened to that. He just cried on his all the way home. Uh, he uh, pulled off, um, and actually it was a kind of a miraculous uh, thing. He, just, he, he personally told me, and he personally told Don Cole, that while he was driving, he just cried while his hands are on the steering wheel and he put his head down. Now you have to understand wow. he didn't take his foot off the accelerator. 
Uh, yeah. He uh, told me that he wound up on another road. Uh, he had taken apparently a loop all the way, you know, because they do have those, you know, um, clover leaf. <laughs> he had yeah. taken a clover leaf and uh, wound up on another street, and then he realized, oh, I probably better pull over <laughs> without looking. <laughs> and uh, man, he, he could have died right then. And he did. He did tell me that he felt that, that the Lord had had stopped him. Uh, from dying because, uh, I mean, you know, he just fell under such conviction of, of sin. Uh, so he, uh, you know, changed his life. He, the Lord changed him, actually. It wasn't that he did it. And so that's how my father got, got saved. Um, wow, and uh, years later, he awesome. had a chance to tell Pastor Cole that story personally. That's an awesome, awesome testimony, brother. You know, those are the words I uttered also when I got saved. Didn't know, and it's just I think that this is what we probably all say when mm-hmm. uh, you know whether it's by justification by faith or recognizing Jesus as Lord, it's it's like a huge veil is lifted, and that is just an awesome, awesome testimony and tribute to your dad, brother. Um, mm. Yeah, I got. I got. I'm getting. I'm getting a little emotional dang. right now. Just, I just want you to know that. So I got to go ahead and uh, gather myself for a minute here. Um, okay. Um, my mother but, came uh, to Christ in a more quiet way. I'll, I'll give you a quick, a uh, quick story on her. My mother also, um, you know, definitely came came to know the Lord Jesus. Um, hers was a more uh, a quiet uh, conversion, as as it were. But then after that, they both ended up really loving gospel music. They began, you know, they might barbershop music, which is, you know, Light of Rose or something like that, or Sweet Adeline. But, uh, you know, my parents loved gospel music, and uh, one of their favorite songs was Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. I will never forget, you know, after I'd wandered in darkness astray, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart, and um, they love to hear uh, songs of uh, you know of praise. Bill Gaither and John Peterson and other uh, you know uh, music writers uh, and singers that told the story. And uh, so my parents uh, ended up both accepting the Lord, and uh, they have both gone on to be with the Lord. And my, my both my mother and my father uh, were able to control by by God's permission, you know what was said during their uh, uh, funeral, you know, because they were able to discuss what they wanted to have done in their funeral services. Um, and uh, they wanted to know the gospel again when went through. Uh, it did cause us, uh, obviously, a breakup with the rest of my family because my family otherwise would, would be RLDS and all of our friends were RLDS and so forth. But by that time, we were in another city. Uh, we didn't have the same influences. We didn't have the same people that were there. And so it was. I think that God's timing was was uh, was for them. And so uh, well, they left the church as a group. Awesome. That's awesome, brother. Um, that's terrific to you know know that your parents came forward and that your immediate family. I mean, your siblings and yourself have uh, all embraced the Lord. And that's. I mean, that's a that's a very rare. Thing, uh, and it's just uh, it also it's, it's a great thing that you know your family was close enough, and that they trusted you and your judgment, and um, and yet you were able to talk about these things uh, freely with one another. Even just the idea of going church shopping, and 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 also it's a testimony to how you know people Christian radio is very important. You know, um, I know that you know when you. I, I, I too would listen to Christian radio a lot and those things. I guess after a while they ferment. But uh and, and I absolutely understand now what you what you were alluding to earlier. You know, you can have a religion that teaches, you know, works. And and th- that's all great. But um the Pharisees were also obsessed with works. And yet these men and, and, and Jesus said to the disciples that that the righteousness of the Pharisees that we must supersede the righteousness of the Pharisees, and so he he, he believed that the Pharisees were righteous. That is, they were righteous for the law. They were righteous for the commandments of God. But that righteousness was not sourced in transformation. And one of the things that um, the church 
the Christian church teaches is that, you know, the new birth. The new birth is about genuine transformation. It's it's not about abiding by, you know, the commandments or or the law of God. Uh, and, and, and the law of God is important. But Jesus surmised the entire law of God by saying that, you know, it is how you treat your neighbor and, and that uh, how you want to be treated and, and to love the Lord your God, your God with your whole heart, soul, and mind. So it's an inward transformation that is a, that comes outward. It's, it, it gets externalized, but from the internal. And, and so it, mm-hmm. it becomes a natural thing to do what is right. Um, and, and I think that's the new birth. That's what it is. And one of the things good, I wanted to share point. with you is, you know, one of the things I wanted to share with you is when, when I got saved, um, you know, my father, I, I, I was a man with a, you know, very, very, I had a really bad temper mm-hmm. as a Jehovah witness. And, um, and my father-in-law noticed a difference, you know, um, and he didn't know that I had been born again. And my father-in-law, who we were all going to the same kingdom hall, and he said, there's something about Augie. You know, he seems more at peace nowadays. And, um, you know, my wife at the time was still a believing Jehovah Witness, and she related to this, related that to me later, you know, later on. But, um, and, and that's what it is, is that there's an inward peace, that that uh, the, the peace of, I think part of it is the assurance of salvation, but also it's the peace of knowing Christ. And uh, and so no longer was I doing things because I felt like I had to. I was doing things because I felt compelled to. And there's a difference. Um, so I, yeah, I, I would like to know oh, how... So we heard about the salvation of your parents. Um, and since you were the first, what, what was it that eventually led to your... Uh, coming to Christ. Um, okay, I think uh, there was a couple of people that were influential in my life. Uh, as uh, well, I had many RLDS experiences growing up and things like that. And as I told you, I even felt like I was healed because uh, of of the administration of the church. And so I have uh, many uh, good uh, good friends and relatives and so forth uh, that were you know good influences on me. But uh, a turning point in my life um, came about my first year of college. Now, I had always been a person somewhat of a scientific-type bent uh, inclination. Um, you know, I was strongly influenced by the uh, you know, evolutionary teachings and so forth of our uh, uh, public school system. <laughs> and so I, you know, did believe – yeah – I, you know, I did believe that people, you know, ascended you know, through evolutionary processes and whatnot. But the turning point came, uh, and I was, uh, you know, stuck between atheism and interested in spiritual things. I was also interested in the occult. And uh, oddly enough, uh, although I had this bent that was towards science and atheism, um, I also had an interest in the in the uh, paranormal and the psychic and in inexplicable events and things like that. And I did used to make fun of high school Christians and things like that that were, uh, you know, born again. And I used to, you know, think that they were a little, you know, a little nutty. But it wasn't until I got to uh, college uh, that things changed. The turning point came my first year of college. I was uh, uh, um, a freshman just attending college. I mentioned I was part of a, a small RLDS congregation, which was actually in Kankakee, Illinois. And... Um, uh, two things happened. Number one is the pastor of the church, uh, who was a high priest, had asked me the uh, press, uh, the uh, Sunday school teacher of the senior high class. And so uh, they needed someone to fill that role. And uh, I seem to know an awful lot about our own church history and doctrine. And so uh, he asked if I'd be a Sunday school teacher. And I said, yes. Uh, I said, yeah, I, I, I can do that, and uh, I, I trusted that that would you know, work well. And so I took myself and applied myself seriously to even, you know, getting the standard works, which were the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants. The RLDS does not have the uh, Pearl of Great Price the Mormons do. And uh, then the second thing is I happened to meet Joe, who was a born-again Christian uh, in the student lounge of uh, my high school, or excuse me, of my college. And... Uh, that was a second important influence. Uh, Joe was a person who uh, was uh, formerly a Satan worshiper. 
Uh, wow. He had actually worshipped the devil, and I thought, no, nah, I don't believe that. And uh, I, I thought he was trying to just, you know, put me on or something like that. Uh, because mm-hmm. he looked like a normal person, <laughs> and uh, so <laughs> me I, I born think, showing. <laughs> no, no, he was. See, the thing was, now he was a born again Christian, yeah. and uh, and uh, I, you know, but I had read all this other book stuff. I told you that uh, I mentioned I was a reader, and so I, I asked him everything I'd ever heard of about the occult, and everything I had ever read about. He knew. He knew way way more. And when I say I was interested in the occult, I was interested in, in such that I had, you know, I, I bought a book on the black arts, on black magic and witchcraft and things like that and read several mm-hmm. things. And he knew everything I'd ever heard of and, and way more. And wow. uh, he talked about supernatural power, uh, you know, that occurred while he was involved in Satan worship. And I said, well, why did you become a Christian? And he, you know, he began to share the gospel with me. It's just how people that lived in the occult and in black arts and uh, committed suicide, they were depressed, they were horrible, they had no future in their lives. And the people that he met as Christians had such peace. They had joy, they had love in their hearts, and they, uh, they had truth. And so Joel was, began sharing scriptures with me. Well, I was officially an RLDS Sunday school teacher, so I should know all the scriptures. Anyway, and so he began giving me gospel tracts and tracts about salvation and tracts about being born again. And so I figured he must be understanding this stuff all wrong. So I took his tracks. I went and I looked them up in my version of the Bible, which did have some words changed. Um, but basically, in a lot of areas, not all, but in a lot of areas, Joseph Smith did not change the Bible. When I say change the Bible, I mean he literally changed it from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, and there were a, a number of changes uh, in, you know, and he would take verses and ch- change them to the opposite. Like one, for example, that would be noticeable to us, to you maybe, would be we changed the uh, the Lord's Prayer. Um, in the uh, King James translation, it would say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And in our uh, church, uh, we said, and suffer us not to be led into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because during the time of Joseph Smith, people would point out, well, there's contradictions in the Bible because the book of James has got, you know, uh, let no man say when he is tempted, I am being tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. And so God can't be tempted with evil. So why would you pray, lead us not into temptation, if God can't be tempted with evil, right? And wow. neither does God tempt anyone. So if God doesn't tempt you, you don't need to pray that question. And so Joseph Smith says, hmm, I think that's right. And so he uh, changed uh, the way that the Lord's Prayer went so that it says, and suffer us not to be led into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so that's the way it read in, in my version of the Bible, for example. And Smith, Joseph Smith, to tell you the truth, felt that he was correcting errors in the Bible or correcting contradictions uh, in the Bible. And so he went and changed a lot, a lot of parts. Um, I could talk some more on that subject if you want me to but I, 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 yeah, I didn't want to ask you a question is this the same uh, King James version that the LDS church has the LDS church uh, doesn't have the copyright to the same version because the RLDS uh, church or the community of Christ holds the copyright to it however um, those changes number one have gone out of copyright so because copyright expires on works that were published <laughs> prior to 1925, oh. and so uh, they have the right to publish it, but for many years they did not do it. And the second reason is, is um, so, so the, RLDS, the, Mor- the Mormon Bible is a King James mm. translation, and they have little footnotes at the bottom of the page that say the Joseph Smith version says this instead. Ah. Whereas the RLDS, they don't have the King James version and the Joseph Smith version, they just have the Joseph Smith version. <laughs> and so they have an entirely different set of, of passages. Ah. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I never knew about this this other version because um, I, 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 I have a quad and I, have, I think I have a triple. I have a triple. Yeah. Um, the triple I have, uh, the King James version that the current LDS church passes out with the, their King James version doesn't have it's pretty much a, it pretty much is still just the King James version, with the exception I think of maybe two passages mm-hmm. that are very are different. But uh, so uh, that's why I, I, I found this interesting because um, you know I, I tell you it's notorious that that cultists love to change the Bible, and so oh, they do, they do. 
I mean, you you would probably be surprised at how they changed John one one. For many many people, you know, John one one is a pivotal verse. It's a verse that's yeah. you know almost memorized, and Jehovah's Witnesses have a particular point of view on that. And I'll bet Gus that you could probably quote John one one from memory, can't you? Right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, the thing with the witnesses is just like the Mormon churches, uh, except mm-hmm. for the Mormon churches are a lot more upfront. They say that they don't believe the Bible is inerrant. Um, mm-hmm. right. Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah's Witnesses will say that they believe the Bible is inerrant, but they really don't believe that. <laughs> they don't believe the Bible is inerrant. They, they, yeah, they, yeah. They believe their Bible, their Bible is inerrant, <laughs> not the other mm-hmm. Bible. Yes. Yes. As a, as, as a matter of fact, the, the Bible I was raised in is the only version of the Bible I have ever seen in my life which has an introduction explaining how unreliable, corrupt, mismanaged, and uh, you know deviant that the Bible is in the very beginning pages in the preface. So they have to justify why they made so many changes. So for most people, John 1, 1 begins like this. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's a testimony right. to the deity of Christ. In the beginning was the Word. It's a reference to Christ, because it says in John one fourteen, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And the Word was with God, so the, the Word was with God, and yet at the same time the Word was God. Right. Um, and that's, that sets up uh, part of the mystery, as you, as you mentioned a little bit earlier. You know, people well, I say, oh, how can you be with God and also be God at the same time? Right. Well, okay, and so Joseph Smith felt that you know this is not right, and so he changed it. Here's a version that I uh, was raised with. That I'm reading in front of it right now. In the beginning was the gospel preached through the Son. The word is gone. The word word is gone. In the beginning was the gospel preached through the Son, and the gospel was the word, and the word was with the Son. Wow. And the Son was with God, and the Son was of God. And so... Instead of three clauses, that's not, that's not even a paraphrase. That's like the old. He's got five. Yeah, yeah, he's got five clauses, and uh, in, instead of the word was in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the gospel preached through the son. The gospel was with the word. The word was with the son. The son was with God, and the son was of God. And so he has. Uh, yeah, it's not even a paraphrase. It's a it's a complete fantasy. Um, <laughs> but so Smith felt that he was correcting uh, errors that had crept into the Bible. And so I was um, intrigued. Now, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, I got these gospel tracts. And although Joseph Smith did change a lot of things, like this example right here I just gave you, in many places he left it entirely alone. And so John 3.16 in the Bible I was raised in is exactly the same as you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. A right. lot of the Bible passages uh, you know, for, one, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God, the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. If you shall repent, you know, um, of your sins, of re, you know, the Bible says, if repent, uh, if you shall confess with your mouth to the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raises the dead. You know, John, excuse me, uh, Romans uh, 10, 9 and 10. Uh, mm-hmm. It's the very same in mine as it is in uh, the King James Version or in any other translation of the Bible. Right. You know, were not changed by Joseph Smith, uh, although right. he did change lots of things. <laughs> so, uh, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Uh, so, so many things are are not uh, altered. And so, I began to you know memorize some of these verses that this Christian had given me because I thought he must be misunderstanding. He must not be understanding things right. But then I thought, well, wait a minute. Wouldn't it be great if he became an RLDS member? Wouldn't it be great if he read the Book of Mormon? Um, <laughs> And so it would be so cool. And so I began giving him copies of the Book of Mormon, and, and he didn't want to read it. And I said, oh, no, no, just try and read it. And I began telling him, you know, telling him uh, about it. And he, he still didn't want to read the Bible, but he did come to church with me one time. He said, boy, your church is really boring. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he was talking about how in his church that he'd come from, people really loved the Lord, and they were, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit, and they were seeing miracles and things like that. All right. Well, the turning point comes in my life as another person enters, and this guy's name is Bill, and I've known Bill for a long time. And Bill was a Methodist, and uh, he went to the same high school I went to, and, and so Bill and Joe and I, we were all the same age. And uh, we began hanging out together. And um, I thought, well, boy, I can, I can bring Bill over to my church, 
and maybe Bill will be will be easier uh, than uh, than Joe is. And so Bill was a Methodist, and I began trying to tell him to read the Book of Mormon and follow uh, and to listen to our church gospel and, and and my message. And Joe began trying to witness to Bill. And so both of us were trying to bring Bill to uh, our different <laughs> points of view. Uh, and I remember Bill saying to me, he says, well, why would I need to join the church anyway? Like, we all believe in the same Jesus. I remember looking at Bill and I says, no, Bill, we do not believe in the same Jesus your church believes in. I says, you believe in the Jesus who's got lockjaw. Your belief Jesus stopped talking to men 2,000 years ago. Our Jesus still talks to men today. He still gives new revelation. And as a matter of fact, when we have the book of Doctrine and Covenants, it has blank pages at the back so we can paste in new revelations when they come in. Because we're <laughs> in, in, in the RLDS church, new revelations every two years. <laughs> uh, yeah, every, every two years there would be revelation from the prophets yeah, you know, of, uh, in Independence, Missouri. <laughs> And so we paste in new, new revelations. And so our church still speaks. And it was, to me, that was a pretty good argument. Because right. you say Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So if he is, how come he stopped talking? How come he's not giving new revelations like he used to, right? And so we would say our church is the one that's the true successor. And uh, our church is the one that's got the truth. Um, and uh, he says, well, wow, I don't have a, you know, a, a different uh, message like that. So Bill started reading the Book of Mormon. And Bill is really on the verge of converting to the RLDS church. And, and Bill was, you know, uh, uh, was, uh, you know, he couldn't do anything at that point. But then there was, uh, oh, I, I do remember. Here's what happened. Joe decided he wants to bring Bill to uh, a church which is going to preach the gospel. So he takes him to a Baptist uh, revival. He takes Bill to a Baptist revival. And uh, Bill goes to this thing, and I'm uh, at that time I'm working uh, nights, and uh, I come home from work late at night, and Bill calls me up, and he says, Eric, I can't come and join the church. I says, Bill, where are you? He says, I'm at so and so Baptist Church, and I, I won't I won't say the name. I says, What are you doing there? He says, Well, Joe brought me here. I says, Yeah. Well, Joe told me it was an interdenominational youth rally. Yeah. Well, I brought my Book of Mormon, and they noticed it as soon as I walked in the front door. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in the pastor's office right now, and he says I can't leave, <laughs> but I can have one phone call. <laughs> and so uh, I says, Bill, or no, I says, yeah, Bill, give me the address. I'm coming right over. So <laughs> uh, I got in the car. Uh, I was, you know, I got in the car. It was probably about six o'clock at night, and I, uh -huh. I brought my Bible, my Book of Mormon, my Doctrine and Covenants, you know, because I was, you know, I was a Sunday school teacher who was responsible for bringing Bill into the Book of Mormon, and Bill had carried his Book of Mormon with him in there. And so I come in, uh -huh. and I meet the uh, pastor of the church, and the pastor of the church had this silver hair. He was an old man, and he was one of these, you know, southern kind of guys with a little southern twall, you know, and. Yeah. Uh, uh, and he, his, his hair was slicked back, and he had another guy that was a visiting missionary. And this visiting missionary, I promised you, he looked like he was a U.S. Marine drill instructor. You know, he, his <laughs> hair was like one half an inch, you know, and uh, or you know, a quarter of an inch from his head. And he was, you know, he was really a tough guy, a hard man. I come into the, the church, and I remember praying before I got out of the car. I said, God, just help me to be a good witness for Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon, and. Uh, and uh, I remember praying, and uh, let me know what to say to this man, because he doesn't understand our church. And as soon as I get into the door, he says, you're a satanic deceiver of innocent young boys, <laughs> as pastor says to me. And he said, I'm, I'm a what? A uh, satanic deceiver of innocent young boys. And uh, he decides to come on, like the really hard case to me. He says, you know what? Your prophet Joseph Smith was hung as a horse thief. Pardon me? I asked hung as a horse thief, and that's what I said, you know. And the truth is, I was not only familiar with our church, I had, as a matter of fact, uh, done a, a paper on Mormonism and the early history of the church for uh, college. Uh, we had a U.S. history class, and I had received uh, an A-plus for that paper, which was on the origin of the Mormon church. And so I, I knew it really, really well. <laughs> And I said, no, absolutely not, you know. Uh, and I, I, I told him that you, all you have to do is read the World Book Encyclopedia, and you can find out that he was, you know, that he was, it was killed in June 1844, you know, out of Carthage, Illinois, as a mob. 
And, you know, and then he says, you know what? The Bible says you smell like the vomit of a dog. And uh, I had absolutely no idea where he was coming that from. But he says, the Bible says you smell like the vomit of a dog. And I, I just, again, this this is extremely adversarial. This guy is out to, you know, just see if he can anger anger me. And uh, I said, no, no, no. We, we believe in Jesus, you know. Uh, what, I, you know, I, I, I said, you know, I, I don't remember what I said. I said, the Bible does not say I smell like the vomit of a dog. If you open your Bible, you won't find my name anywhere in it. <laughs> you know, I do remember telling him that. You know? I do remember telling him that. You won't find my name anywhere in it. Go ahead and put your finger on my, you know, that kind of thing. And so we got we got angry. And he says, you guys, you believe in a false Jesus. He says, which Jesus do you believe in? He was asking me, which Jesus do you believe in? I says, I believe in Jesus of the Bible. You know. Uh, he says, which Jesus? And he wanted to know which Jesus, because the Bible says there's many Jesuses. And I says, I believe in the Jesus who was born of the Virgin Mary. That one, the one that was, you know, taken, you know, to Bethlehem, uh, the one the angels sang when he was, you know, uh, uh, unto us, and that, that, that one. And I, I actually opened up his Bible. And I says, do you see John 3, 16 there? You know, God so loved the world. I put my finger on the that verse, I said, that's the one I believe in. What's wrong with that one? You know, he was very upset about, you know, uh, uh, because he wanted me to say which Jesus I believed in, you know, and uh, I and he he wasn't happy with with you know, and I said, well, Jesus is the son of you know, is the son of God. He says, which son of God? I said, he is the son of God, and he's the Christ. He's the Messiah. What what more do you want? And you know, sometimes people want a particular answer. And what right. he really wanted me to say, we were talking, you know, after a while, I said, what, what's, what, what's the right answer? He says, he's the son of the living God. And because I didn't say son of the living God, I was, you know, I just said he's, he's the son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, you know, the one who died for our sins on the cross. You know, that wasn't good enough. He was the son of the living God, I should have said, you know. And he says, you all, you know, and I says, you know, he, he had no idea what he really believed in. Uh, and so basically, he had uh, uh, made some awful, awful claim. He says, "You know, you guys believe that you're Mormons. Uh, you're all saved by your works." And actually, at that point in my life, I was really reading the verses in the Bible very carefully. And so I quoted to this Baptist pastor, uh, excuse me, Ephesians two eight and nine from memory. No, for by grace it is that ye are saved through faith. It is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's what we believe. (laughs) And uh, he said, we believe that you're saved by your grace, saved by grace. You're judged by your works. And he says, no, anybody judged by their works goes to hell. And so he got got really, really mad at me. We... um, uh, we uh, we ended up having a nasty argument. Um, he uh, he knew absolutely nothing about the church. He was ignorant. Uh, I mean, just terribly. Uh, he was convinced Mormonism was false. They didn't know why. And uh, it was just a terrible, terrible experience. Um, it turned out that he had uh, told Bill that if we didn't get saved tonight, Satan was going to strike us dead before we left the church property. Oh my and goodness. and uh, I, I said, you know, we're not getting anywhere. We're just going to have to leave. And so Bill told me that as we're getting into the car, because Bill and Joe, uh, you know, they had gotten a ride to the church, and so I was their ride back home. So there's this car in the parking lot. There's me and Bill and Joe all in the car, you know. And um, uh, I obviously had not converted to the Baptist faith, and he hadn't converted to Mormonism, and we had had this awful, awful argument back then. And um, uh, we we just con- were so angry, I guess, uh, if you can put it that way, you know, and that the pastor had said that if we would strike us dead, not God, before we left the church property. And uh, I was so mad, and we uh, tore out of that place, and, you know, I was driving – and uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, we live in rural Illinois, and we lived on this country road. And I was so mad, I didn't see this red light. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, 
I was just infuriated with what had happened. And Joe was in the back seat. I'm driving. Bill's in the passenger side in the front. And do you know what the Doppler effect is? <laughs> the Doppler effect is when you have this, you know, like a, a, a train that's coming towards you, ah, you know, really loud. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was a car, a car horn. <laughs> and this car uh, had uh, seen me not stop. And he just hung on his horn just past us. We almost got hit. We wow. almost got hit, like within an inch of being hit. And then we thought, oh, man, what if it's true? <laughs> what if what the pastor <laughs> said was really true? And uh, so Satan did try to stalk us dead. And so uh, we decided we had to get this Mormon stuff out of our minds. And I dropped Joe off, who's this Christian, dropped him off right away. I <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, you know, we had to get it off of our mind. Now, next turning point. And the question is, what makes me the way exactly I am? Bill, my friend, my friend Bill, who I tried to bring in the RLDS church, was so upset by this. He was wondering, well, how come people are saying all these things about the Mormons? Why are they saying all these things about the Mormons? Who are the Mormons? I know. I'll call them up. Bill, the next day, called up. LDS missionaries, who I believe were apostates, he called up the LDS missionaries, and they came over and began giving him lessons. He converted to the LDS church in less than a week. They told him he must have been a very advanced spirit in preexistence because they'd never had anybody convert so fast. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. And so... So my friend Bill calls up and he says, Eric, I'm joining the LDS church. Well, wait a minute. A week ago you said you can't join my church. Now you're going to join the LDS church. He says, no. I've, I mean, he had the missionaries and they had scheduled a baptism for him. And he was inviting me to come to his baptism into the LDS. I said, no, these are the other side. This is the enemy. You know, the, uh, oh, man. Um, and so my best friend converts to the LDS church. I will say that previous to that, I had had no real contact with the LDS church, so I didn't really know exactly what they believed. I, you know, I just knew that some of the things our church said that they believed, but I didn't really know them. And so when Bill joined the LDS church, I mean, he let me join, go to his baptism, and I was he invited Joe too, but Joe didn't want to go. So I went to his baptism. The only... The only small thing that came out of it was, was that I did want, that they did sing my favorite song. Uh, both LDS and the RLDS share a lot of hymns in common, and uh, my favorite song at that time was The Spirit of God Like a Fire is Burning, um, which was hymn number 283 out of our hymnal. And uh, they played th- that very same hymn for, the, for Joe's, or excuse me, for Bill's baptism <laughs> into the LDS church. And so then, uh, you know, Bill began trying to proselyte me to join the Mormons. <laughs> and so there was there was definitely a struggle, a spiritual uh, pull, three different ways, you know, to join the Mormons or the LDS wow. or RLDS. Or Joe was trying to bring me to salvation and things like that. So so did, uh, so, did um, Bill, is Bill still in LDS, uh, uh, Latter-day Saint? Is he, uh, still no, Mormon? actually, Bill Bill has passed away. Uh, and oh, okay. uh, he uh, he'd left the LDS Church. Um, I will say a couple other things, uh, so I can kind of give you a couple of uh, differences. When after Bill joined oh, the LDS I, Church, I, I just wanted to know we're, we're down we're down to the last twelve minutes of the program. The two hours went by. Five. Oh my goodness! I'll make it quick. I'll make it quick. <laughs> yes. He invited the LDS missionaries to come and witness to me, and so the Mormon missionaries came to my door, and I was already in our LDS, and so. The LDS missionary said, look, we want to express to you what was told to us by uh, one of our prophets, Lorenzo W. Snow. Uh, they believe that there is no salvation without exaltation. And exaltation means exaltation to godhood. And they had a quote. It said, salvation without exaltation is damnation. You have to know exaltation in order to uh, obtain celestial glory. Um, and so there was that, there, the whole view was that you have to join the LDS church in order to be saved. Well, um, then, meanwhile, Joe was trying to share what gospel with me and things like that. And I was talking about him, well, we've got to keep the commandments. We have to keep the commandments to be exalted to, to celestial glory, don't we? And then Joe shared a scripture with me from, the, you know, um, the book of John, chapter 6, where one time the Pharisees asked Jesus, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? 
And, of course, in my mind, what would you do to work the works of God? You'd keep the commandments, right? Right. But Jesus said, no, this is the work of God, that ye believe on the one whom he has sent. Wow. Um, the work of God is doing good works. <laughs> the work of God is to believe on the one whom he has sent. I remember that really kind of surprised me that I didn't quite understand. Um, we receive salvation as a gift. It's not earned. And Joe shared a number of scriptures with me, you know, about salvation as being a gift, not as a result of works, not as a result that we owned it or we deserved it and so forth. Um, and Joe, uh, you know, asked, you know, finally, um, a couple other things happened. One of them was to said, uh, Joe's father worked for the uh, phone company, and they were moving him. You know, there was a lot of moves that took place in the last part of my life. And uh, Joe was moving away. And uh, so he only had, like, one more chance to see me. And he felt the Lord had put a scripture uh, on his heart that he felt compelled to share with me um, from uh, the book of Joshua, chapter 24. Because he knew that I was at a, a turning point in my life, at a crossroads. Joshua 24 Says, verse 14 says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, which is the river, and serve right. the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he asked me to make a decision to, you know, because I had heard the gospel many, many, many times, but Sometimes it just talks and takes a friend to say, do you want to receive Jesus Christ? And he just yeah. said, do you want to pray with me? And instantly I knew he meant pray the prayer of salvation. And I said, yes. Uh, I, I, said, I said, yes, I do want to. Uh, I do want to. And he says, okay. I said, what do I have to do? He says, well, pray with me. Lord, dear Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner. And as he began to pray in that prayer, I felt, I'm not a sinner. I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. I've never taken a drink of alcohol in my life. I've never been drugged. I even know where the police station's at. I've never been to jail or you know. I, I but mm -hmm. then all these scriptures that I had memorized earlier came back to my mind. There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. All we like sheep have gone astray. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You know, all of sin come short of the glory of God. They all came back. He says, okay, and then I, I said, yeah, all right. I, I am a sinner. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I want to accept Jesus as Lord. And for many times, as RLDS members, we had capitalized on this doctrine, um, that, uh, which is the, each person has the right, they call it agency, each person has the right to choose for themselves what they want to do. Well, from now on, I was giving my agency over to Jesus. Instead of being my agent, I was going to be Jesus' ambassador. I was going to be his servant, his disciple, his follower. And... Um, Finally, Joe, you know, I, I said, okay, I'm going to accept Jesus as Lord. It meant that Jesus was going to rule my life. He, I would do whatever he wanted me to do. And uh, I said, Joe, I don't think I have as much faith as you do. And he says, look, the Bible says the man's gift is accepted according to what he has, not according to what he doesn't have. You don't have to measure your faith against mine. If you're believing with all that you have, that's all that God requires. That's Amen. all that God requires. And I uh, said, okay, to so Jesus, I trusted in him. And I said, I, I believe. Hey, Joe, I don't feel anything different. And he says, No, you're 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 not. You, you didn't pray a prayer to have tinglings or you know on your skin or something like that. You received Jesus Christ by faith. If you had been in, in prison and suppose that you were in guilty of a crime and you were on death row and then you received a pardon from the governor, wouldn't you be grateful for that? I says, Yeah, I would. You know. He says, The Bible says angels are rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents. Uh, God is throwing a party over you in heaven right now for anyone that turns for Christ. And when I believe wow. that the Bible's answer was true instead of my feelings were true, that's when the joy came. I had a joy. I had peace. I was just amazed, amazed at the response um, uh, that, you know, that, that happened. You know, for, for me, the, the pivotal issue is that there's a spiritual hunger to know God. I wasn't saved because Joe had a big argument against the Book of Mormon. I was not saved because Joe had a big argument against Joseph Smith. I wasn't saved by being proven that Joseph Smith was a bad guy. 
I was saved because I had a spiritual hunger for God. And anyone Amen. who has a hunger for God can find it answered in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, brother. Hey, um, our listeners, we're down to the last minutes of the program, but and I just want to apologize, but I want to give you guys a chance to go ahead and um, talk to Eric, ask him a question, share a comment. Press 1, the number is 347-934-0379. Just press 1. This is the last five minutes of the program and an opportunity to to talk about what you've heard. And um, and if not, you know, then it's still the last five minutes of the program. Um, so just press 1 if you're listening by computer. The number is 347 Eric, that is an awesome testimony, and uh, I got to confess, brother, I'll tell you, I had to gather myself today because <laughs> uh, uh, your father's testimony was just, it just got to me. It got to me, brother. But um, um, it's just, it's a wonderful work that God has done in your family, and um, I just thank you for coming on and sharing your testimony and how you came to Christ and, and the battles that you had to go through. You know, it's, it's not any one thing, but it's just an accumulation of things. God is constantly put before us, even amongst ignorant Christians. like that mm-hmm. pastor. It's funny um, because, um, you know, he may not have said anything that that penetrated, but that one thing, <laughs> the prediction about your death, and then your close call, but made, it was just a small seed. It was just God's way of just planning something for you to remember. And uh, and you remember these things because you wouldn't retell them if you didn't remember it. And so oh, they yeah. had it. It, it. You know what? I, I'll tell you what happened to me one time. I, I spoke to a pastor in the Lutheran church, and I was attending, and I told him it would be great if someone went and knocked on my mom's because she told me no one has ever knocked on her door. And so my pastor called another pastor in North Carolina and told the pastor the situation. And you know what? That pastor didn't knock on her door. He called her. And Uh I said, I didn't ask you to call her. I asked you to knock on her door. I said, now she's upset, and still no one has ever knocked on her door. And he said, you know what? He says, doesn't matter. He said, "It, it doesn't matter. He says, the fact is the gospel was presented to her, and that's all that matters. And um, and I knew he was right, even though I was angry at him. And it's taken, you know, it took a little while for it to settle in me because I was so upset about it. But I was thinking, you know what, Lord, you're right. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter. You know what? If someone even, if someone even knocked on her door, she would still probably reject them because it's all about your Holy Spirit touching her heart. So it doesn't matter. There's a church on every corner. There's Christian radio. There's Christians on TV preaching the gospel and that declaration somebody has to knock on my door, it's just it's just baloney. It's just an obstacle mm-hmm. for her and just something to prove something and, and it really doesn't prove anything because someone could knock on her door and she would just reject them flat out right there on her doorstep. But all that matters is that she heard the word. And so, um, brother, I just hope that Mormons are hearing the word today and that they are listening to your testimony and and um uh, there's so I tell you, there's so much stuff that, about the RLDS Church that I still now want to tap into. I, I hope we can get you on again um, sometime next year in 2014 and and talk a little more about the RLDS Church because it's just stuff that people have not really heard about or know much of. And um, I, um, your friend uh, Joe, is, do, you, do you still have contact with him? Um, he's, uh, uh, he's living on the West Coast right now. Uh, and, uh, no, we've, uh, we've kind of fallen, uh, on, on different directions. You know, Joe was a, a good Christian. He did love the Lord. Um, and, uh, he, uh, you know, he is not doing as, uh, as well as the time that he was witnessing to me. And so appreciate uh, people if they would pray for him. So, <clears throat> Yes, that's but uh, I, I did believe the gospel. The gospel is true, even though sometimes a person might backslide and not have a you know a, a life that they that they wanted to. Uh, things didn't turn out for him the way that he kind of hoped, and so uh, pray pray for Joe. I appreciate it. Uh, Bill, uh, it, ha- Bill it happens. It happens. It happens to 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, brother, I just uh, so I, I just want to thank you again for coming on the program and um, uh, thank the listeners for listening. And uh, we have next week Dr. Ron Rhodes. And uh, until next week, I just want to, you know, wish you all well in the week and, and may God bless you and, and pray for Mormons, both RLDS and LDS, and pray for Jehovah's Witness. Pray for those that are trapped in the cult. And so um, God bless you, Eric, and your family. And um, uh, until next week, thank on blogtalkradio.com, healing excel week. Take care. Yeah, thank you. God bless you, brother. And so just tune in to Block Talk Radio. If you have an email you want to shoot us, HealingXOutreach at Yahoo.com. Any criticisms, comments, questions, HealingXOutreach at Yahoo.com. And God bless you all, and you all have a great weekend. Don't forget to turn your clocks back. <laughs> it's all <laughs> backwards. So turn your yeah. clocks back, and you all have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.